Hello and welcome to my weekly podcast, Stuff You Didn't Know About Acts, or maybe you did know it, or maybe you don't agree with it. Today we are in Acts 16. Well, not exactly. Actually, I want to start with Acts 15.36, which is after the Jerusalem Council. The end of the chapter basically says they went back to Antioch, things were hunky-dory for a little bit, and then Paul and said and Barnabas said, hey, let's go back to the to the mission trip. Let's go back and revisit the churches we've been to. By the way, here's a principle of church growth and planting. Uh, don't just think that you can get somebody to pray a sinner's prayer and say, okay, you're good. Bye. See you later. There has to be this thing called discipleship. Uh, in fact, you may have noticed from Acts 28 um, that it's, that we, you know, that's the great commission there. Um, go make disciples of every nation. It doesn't say go uh, get them to pray a prayer and be baptized, and that's it. It actually says make disciples, and then it tells us what that means. Bapti- yes, baptizing is part of it, ba- baptizing them, and what's the second part? Teaching them all the things that I have commanded you. And so discipleship is not just what we might call in a narrow sense evangelism. Hey, Jesus died and rose from the dead. Good stuff. That's, uh, of course, <laughs> crucial as well. But uh, making disciples involves some time. You're going to have to spend some time. Uh, And so Paul and Barnabas, recognizing this, are going to go back uh, to Cyprus. Now, Paul and Barnabas have different gifts, right? God, God uses people, ordinary people. He uses people with different kinds of gifts. Barnabas is definitely better at the um, encouragement, the the build, building, the long term. Barnabas is good for the long haul discipleship. Paul is more of a missionary church planter. Uh, Paul doesn't stay as long. In fact, in Romans 15, we find out that he doesn't tend to go where other people have gone. He he doesn't build on others. He's not a he's not a discipler uh, exactly, uh, but he is more of a get you in the door uh, kind of person, a blaze the trail kind of person, an entrepreneur kind of person. By the way, I'm not at all. And if you've been listening to these these uh, podcasts and videos on Acts, you know that I don't pigeonhole people into. Well, I'm sorry, I don't do discipleship. I just get people to pray the prayer. Um, it's not neatly divided off like that. But there are certain clear kind of strengths in certain areas. Some people are better at building the systems and some people are better at inventing the systems. That's just, the, that's human personality. Some people, uh, the rare birds can do both. So all of that is to say is that the um, the real next section, I would say, begins, that is the second missionary journey, as it's sometimes called. Acts doesn't call it that. Um, in fact, it's not Paul's second missionary journey, probably. He's already uh, done some preaching in Arabia. He's probably done some preaching in Cilicia, maybe Cappadocia. Uh, so it's not really his second missionary journey, but it's the second missionary journey uh, in the book of, that the book of Acts tells us about. There's a whole lot more that went on in the early church than the book of Acts could fit into even 28 chapters. It may seem long to me as a boy. 28 chapters seem like 28 chapters, you know, um, but that wasn't uh, anything. That wasn't enough uh, to capture um, the the many things that must have happened in the early church. And I can't wait uh, when we get to heaven to hear about them. So the next the next part really begins at the end of chapter 15, which is a reminder that the chapter divisions were not there uh, in the original book of Acts. The book of Acts did not, it didn't even have spaces between words. Uh, so they sure didn't have uh, chapter divisions uh, in the original version of Acts. The chapter divisions as we now have them were added by the Archbishop of Canterbury in the early 1200s. I've seen different dates, 1205, 1227. I didn't do enough invest, investigation to tell you. And the year was, but in the early t- uh, t- uh, 1200s, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, rhymes with Plankton, um, added the chapter divisions as we now have it. And they're not inerrant. Sometimes he got it wrong. Um, there's a, uh, in Hebrews chapter 5, I think the next chapter should have begun with verse 11. Um, so, you know, uh, he's a, he was a fallible human, a smart guy, no doubt, Archbishop of Canterbury in the 1200s. Wow. Um, but um, I'm not the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, so, uh, but but he I, probably he got the, maybe, maybe he got the chapter division a little bit off where it would be optimal here. Well, that was a lot on literary structure, wasn't it? Um, so Paul and Barnabas say, let's go back. Um, and there's a conflict. 
Now, the book of Acts, I've argued that the book of Acts is giving us the squeaky clean resume of the early church. I mean, there's conflict in Acts, but it's all handled very uh, decently and in order. Um, as we said last week, Galatians suggests uh, that things were messier uh, at, the, at the time. So the only thing that Acts tells us about is that Paul and Barnabas argued over Mark. Um, and of course, uh, that uh, I believe they did. Uh, but what was what was really going on? Was it just that Mark was a quitter? I think there was a whole lot more beneath the surface of this iceberg than just fighting over Mark, because of course Paul and Barnabas disagree uh, in uh, Galatians two uh, over whether Jew and Gentile can eat together. Remember, it goes to council um, in Acts fifteen. We get the de- the decision if they will uh, not strangle the meat to death and make sure that there's no blood in the meat and that the meat has not been offered to another idol, and that they won't be sexually immoral, then, yes, Jew and Gentile can eat together. Well, I'm sure Paul had no particular problem with most of that. I mean, I'm not suggesting that Paul, obviously Paul had had no time for sexually immoral people in the Gentile church, as 1 Corinthians indicates very clearly. So I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's so much that Paul disagreed with, with the content of the decision. It's just he felt like uh, as often is the case, there is more going on under the surface than just this decision. You know, the decision, and this is often the case, right? Well, what are you complaining about? There's nothing wrong with this right here. It's more what's going on socially and under underneath prejudices, things like that, um, that maybe don't surface. We don't talk about those. Uh, we, we, we kind of bury them under uh, noble excuses, make ourselves sound noble uh, um, when in fact our motivations may not be that that great. We know from Galatians 2 that Paul and Barnabas disagreed over Jewish and Gentile believers eating together. And Barnabas basically sides with those in authority. Um, and so um, I think maybe more than more than just, uh, and, and of course Acts 15 may be given us kind of a summary of, of what was actually a more uh, drawn out uh, process. We know from Luke 24, where uh, Luke doesn't even mention the trip. There, We know that there are resurrection appearances in Galilee, because Matthew 28, the Great Commission, happens in Galilee. Luke 24, the resurrection story of Luke, tells us nothing about any appearances um, to Galilee. So we know that Luke condenses things sometimes um, for to make it clearer and for more. And, and an art, artist, uh, he's an artist of a writer. And so it may very well be, uh, I think, going on the example of Luke 24, it may very well be that Acts 15 is condensing what actually took more time. It may be, and again, I don't know, you, you can welcome to disagree with this, it's just a hypothesis, that um, that that the decision w- did not come immediately um, in in terms of, of how the, the history unfolded. And so it may be that Paul and Barnabas, that there hadn't been a decision yet, uh, again, some of you will say, "Well, that now that's too that's too far," and, and maybe it is. I, I'm just saying we know that Luke condenses things uh, from from Luke 24. Luke 24 doesn't even mention the 40 days before the ascension. If all we had were Luke 24, we'd think that Jesus more or less rose uh, from the dead and ascended to heaven on the same day. Um, and so Luke does art, artistically uh, uh, syncopate the story, I think, in order to make. Uh, the point clearer, the, and the point is um, the truths about the early church. Um, it's not um, well. I think that he stayed two days, you know, at at Thisbe, you know, wherever. There's no Thisbe. I just made it up. Um, so the conflict between Paul and, Paul and Barnabas, I think, probably was over more than just Mark being uh, a quitter, um, and so they agree to disagree. But th- again, what is what is the takeaway from this? That we don't have to. Uh, argue and argue and argue and argue and argue until we agree. Sometimes we both disagree and you've got to move on. I, I remember um, there was a, a, a tension once uh, in leadership. I was in a particular leadership role and um, I thought that uh, something should go one way and someone else thought that something else should go another way. Uh, and the leader basically said, you all work this out. Well, we disagreed and uh, it was important to me. Um, and by the way, I think history has, has borne out that I was right. Uh, but anyway, that's not important right now. Um, but basically, um, uh, I felt like the leader should step in and say, well, here's the person that wins uh, this debate because we didn't, because the two of us on the same level didn't agree. And in, in effect, the leader did because the leader, uh, the, the leader, I don't, in my opinion, 
couldn't come out and say, uh, Ken, you need to give in. Uh, but after enough, uh, uh, you need to work this out, Ken. Uh, I, I finally came to the conclusion, okay, I'm, being, I'm not being told, but I'm being told that I've lost this argument. And, and so, so it was. And that's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Sometimes, however, we have to agree to disagree. Sometimes, no matter how much we talk to each other, we're not going to agree with each other. And that's okay. There's nothing carnal about disagreement. <laughs> I used to sometimes uh, apologize to my mother, Mom, I'm sorry for arguing with you. And she'd say, we're not arguing. We're just, we're just having a conversation. We're just disagreeing. Um, it's just a disagreement. You know, uh, because in holiness circles, uh, an argument uh, sounded a little bit too carnal. Um, and so we agreed, uh, uh, you know, we're just, com we're just having a conversation. Um, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement. And they did not resolve their disagreement. I mean, they remained friends. Paul speaks of Barnabas positively uh, in 1 Corinthians. Paul speaks positively of Mark uh, in Colossians. And, and what happened as a result? They went their separate ways, and that's okay. Um, Cyprus and Mark go back, uh, I'm sorry, Barnabas and Mark go back to Cyprus, uh, and that ministry increases. Paul takes Silas and heads back to, to Galatia, and that, and that leads them finally uh, to um, to uh, what we would call Greece today. It was Greece then too. Um, but just think of how much longer it might have taken uh, Paul uh, to get to Greece if he'd have gone with Barnabas. Um, I, I heard, by the way, I, maybe I shouldn't share this, but um, uh, because of time, but um, when I was in Germany in 2004, um, my wife and I, it might, it might have been, or it might have been 2012, I can't remember, it was one of those two. We went to a, a church um, uh, where uh, there'd been a split about 10 years earlier. And as a sign of reconciliation, they'd, they'd brought the leader of the split back uh, to speak. He was about to leave Germany, and uh, they brought him back to speak to the congregation that he'd split off from. And he gave interesting, uh, he had an interesting thought, I thought. It's really stuck with me. He said, don't, don't disagree too long. You know, agree to disagree and double your ministry. Um, in other words, we should not have fought over this the way we did. We should have just amicably come to the conclusion that you see it this way and I see it this way. And uh, let's God will use us both. You guys stay here. You do your ministry. And I'll go and I'll build my uh, my my th thoughts on how it should go uh, somewhere else. And maybe we'll get twice as many Christians uh, from it. That really impacted me. We don't have to always come to an agreement. Sometimes we can agree to disagree and double uh, the ministry. Now, he circumcised Timothy. Again, uh, I don't think Paul, I mean, again, I mean, could be wrong. I think Paul, if Paul were to read the book of Acts, uh, and I think Paul was dead uh, for maybe uh, over, well over a decade before Acts was written, as you know. Um, but um, if Paul were to read uh, Acts, I think he probably wouldn't be entirely happy with Luke because Luke makes it sound like uh, Paul is agreeable to circumcising non-Jews. We know from the book of Galatians that Paul was quite adamant. If you guys get circumcised, you will have fallen from grace. Um, you should not, in fact, Paul is emphatic in Galatians. You must not get circumcised. And so the fact that the book of Acts kind of highlights Paul's circumcision of Timothy, I'm not sure what, what Paul would have thought of it, but it does, it fits with, again, this sense that the book of Acts wants Theophilus to know that that Christians are not rabble rousers. They're not um, they're not rebellious kind of people. Uh, the circumcision of Timothy here uh, seems very uh, much appropriate and orderly because um, in Jewish circles, whether or not you're if you have a mixed parentage, you know one parent is uh, Jewish and one parent is not a Jewish. The Mishnah, which is a Jewish collection of teachings from about the year 200 A.D. It indicates that the parentage comes from uh, the mother's lineage. So if the mother is Jewish, the child is Jewish. If the father, if the mother is not Jewish and the father's Jewish, then it's up up for grabs, I think. Um, Timothy's mother is Jewish and she's a devout Jew. And so Paul has her circumcised. I think this shows, given, given what we see in Galatians, um, it shows that Paul is a very practical person. Paul, Paul has Titus, who's a Gentile young man, um, and he sees the opportunity to use Timothy as a kind of intercessor with Jewish communities. He's got a two. He's got two people on his staff, right? Uh, he's got uh, Titus as his um, uh, liaison with Gentiles, and now he, by circumcising Timothy, he has Timothy, his liaison uh, 
uh, with Jewish uh, Christians. And so he can use that, that two-pronged, he's a, he's a smart guy, uh, even inspired, we might say. Um, by the way, Paul uh, will pay a little bit for this uh, because in, um, in uh, Galatians 5.11, the, the uh, op opponents of Paul tell the Galatians, look, Paul circumcised Timothy. And of course, Lystra, where Timothy's from, is in Galatia. Uh, the, the, Lystra is one of the audiences of the book of Galatians. And Paul's opponents have said, look, even Paul knows that circumcision is, is the ideal because he circumcised Timothy. You know Timothy, right? Oh yeah, Timothy's from Lystra. He's a great guy. So, so it, it kind of led the Galatians to say, well, maybe Paul does think it would be optimal for us to get circumcised. And of course, Paul blows a gasket uh, in Galatians. There's that famous verse where he says, I wish those who are wanting you to get circumcised would just cut their whole thing off, uh, which is quite an angry statement if you think about it. And I paraphrased it a little bit. You can read it. It's there in uh, chapter 5, I think it is. But in any case, uh, 512 maybe, uh, I'm not sure. Somewhere in that vicinity, I think, of Galatians. But he's. I, th I think he does it for practical reasons. He doesn't have to do it. Uh, if, if he believes what Galatians says, he doesn't have to circumcise Timothy, but he does circumcise Timothy um, for, the, for the benefit of the ministry. Uh, again, Acts emphasizes the conformity of Paul to the decision of Acts 15. Um, again, uh, I don't think Paul, Paul, well, if you read 1 Corinthians, the issue of meat sacrifice to idols comes up in 1 Corinthians. Does Paul mention this decision? Okay, you guys have a question about meat offered to idols. Let me tell you what the decision of the Jerusalem church is. Eh, Paul does not say that. Paul says, don't ask where the meat came from. Eat it with thanksgiving. Buy it from the marketplace. Don't ask where it came from. There's nothing wrong with the meat itself. Paul says in Romans 14, I'm convinced that nothing is unclean in of itself. Whether it's unclean depends on what you think. If you think it's unclean, then it's unclean. Don't eat it. If your conscience is clear, then you're welcome to eat it as long as you're not hurting somebody else's faith. Um, but So I think Paul might be a little a little unhappy with Luke if he were to read chapter 16, which certainly gives the impression. And, and again, it's not that Acts 16 says anything that's false necessarily. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't say anything that's false. But what, what Acts 16 does is you can tell a story in a certain way, right? And Acts 16 tells the story in such a way that, that certainly could give the impression that Paul was a good little boy uh, who did whatever Jerusalem headquarters told him to do. And I'm not saying that's false. I'm not at all saying that's false. I'm simply saying that Paul might have grumbled a little, well, grumble, grumble, grumble. Hey, I have some footnotes I want to add to this here. Um, I'm sorry, Paul. Um, this is God inspiring me to speak to Theophilus. So I'm going to tell Theophilus what God wants me to tell Theophilus. Uh, but anyway, um, Acts emphasizes Paul's conformity to the decision of Acts 15. Sometimes you hear people that, that, that uh, Paul jumped into Europe uh, when he went to Greece. And I think it's it's significant for us to say that that is a very modern way of thinking about, you know, we don't even realize what we don't, we don't know what we don't know. Um, uh, this Asia Minor was not Turkish 2,000 years ago. The Turks weren't anywhere around. Asia Minor was Greece, Greek, uh, at this particular point. It spoke Greek. Um, and so Paul is not making a major jump from one region to another. The major boundary line of the Roman Empire was way back over at Damascus. Uh, Paul was solidly in Roman territory, and he was solidly in Greek-speaking uh, territory. So this is not a jump to Europe. It is a major jump, of course. This is a major new step in the expansion of the gospel. It was already there, no doubt, because of travelers. I mean, how did it get to Rome? Peter didn't take it, regardless of tradition. Peter, um, anyway, I won't go off on that tangent. Um, and so Greece was not a jump to Europe. It was a major jump, uh, but Paul was going from one Greek-speaking territory to another Greek-speaking territory. Um, it was funny, when I, when I went to Ephesus uh, back in the early 2000s, mid-2000s, um, the, the Greek tour guide, uh, I mean, the, sorry, the Turkish uh, tour guide uh, seemed to make a big point. This was not Greek. This is Turkish. You know, and, um, I don't know what he was trying to emphasize because it's not debatable. Uh, there was no Turkish uh, stuff going on uh, in Asia Minor in the first century. Um, so he, Paul jumps from Greek to Greek. Um, the we passages, the we passages of Acts uh, begin at 1610. And this is where we get the idea that the uh, author of Acts must have been a sometimes traveling companion of Paul because all of a sudden he did this, they did this, he did this, they did that. Then we went over to Philippi. Um, and so uh, 
this is where the race is on to determine inductively who the author of Acts was. The book of Acts never tells us. The book of Luke never tells us who the author is. Um, but we know that the author of Acts was with Paul at the end of um, Acts. And so uh, since tradition says that Colossians uh, was written from uh, there, um, it is, I, I mean, somebody, I mean, maybe they knew it was Luke, but somebody may have done what we do and said, ah, huh, okay, so we know it's a traveling companion of Paul. We know they're with Paul in in uh, Rome. We know that Colossians was written from Rome. So we go through the list of the names of the people uh, who were mentioned uh, there at the end. of, And Luke, Luke, must, uh, Luke will end up as being a major candidate for the author of Luke Acts if you follow that inductive uh, kind of process. I have no, nothing against Luke uh, because, of course, it's, a, it's an odd name to suggest in some ways, although... If you follow the process I just said, I guess it's not so odd after all. Okay, keeping going. The next major stop, they stop at a few little places on the way, but they end up at Philippi, which is a Roman colony. There are these places where, uh, and I think this was very wise on Rome's part, Rome thought, um, uh, we need to get these ex-soldiers out of Rome. You don't want to have a, you don't want a bunch of ex-soldiers and ex-generals lying around Rome uh, because that's a, 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 a overthrow waiting to happen. And so what they did is they gave, and of course it's a good deal for the soldiers too, they gave them property. And so Philippi um, is a, a Roman colony where uh, a bunch of ex-soldiers uh, at one point had been settled. If you were a citizen of the city of, and you could be a citizen of a city, if you were a citizen of the city of Philippi, you were a Roman citizen as if you lived in Rome. Um, and so, uh, by the way, you know in the book of Philippians where Paul says our citizenship is in heaven, that would have been a very poignant uh, comment for the Philippians because some of them may very well have been Roman citizens. And Paul is saying, remember, your loyalty is not to Rome first. Your loyalty is to heaven. You're a citizen of heaven, regardless of what's going on uh, and in prestigious in the book of, of uh, in the city of uh, Philippi. Paul seems to know they'd be down by the riverside. This is a kind of an odd, why would there be a synagogue by the riverside. By the way, synagogue doesn't necessarily refer to a building. Synagogue is a gathering of people. And so there were synagogues that were in buildings, and there were synagogues that were in marketplaces, and there were synagogues that were in houses, and there were synagogues that were by the riverside. And this would seem to be uh, a largely uh, women synagogue here. We don't know exactly what's going on here. I mean, we can do hypotheses. Uh, this is probably around the year AD 50. And so we know that Jews were uh, kicked out of Rome uh, in, this is an interesting hypothesis, I really don't know if it's true or not, but we know that, uh, for example, Priscilla and Aquila, who we're going to meet soon, uh, were uh, kicked out of Rome along with other Jews in the year 49 by Claudius. There was so much division, apparently, uh, in the synagogues of Rome over Jesus that uh, Claudius kicked the Jewish Christians out of Rome. And so it may, may very well be um, that there were Jews who weren't allowed in the city of Philippi as a Roman colony because, or I don't know, maybe they just weren't allowed to have a synagogue in town because of what was going on in Rome. I don't know, but Paul seems to know how to find how to find a synagogue. Paul seems to know, um, and Luke seems to know. Um, notice the prominence of women in Acts. This is one of the special emphases of Luke Acts. Luke Acts gives special attention to the role of women uh, in the early church. This is quite revolutionary, quite spectacular. And Lydia, a seller of purple, she's not just a woman, she's a, she's a merchant. Uh, she's from Thyatira. Uh, she sells purple, which is an expensive dye. This is a wealthy woman who apparently has a very large house. And this will be the house church probably that starts uh, Philippi. Interesting that she's not mentioned uh, in Philippians. It could be that she'd moved on by then. could be that she had another name like Iodia or Syntyche who are mentioned in uh, the book of Philippians. Uh, but uh, her whole household is baptized. And I think this is interesting. Uh, we are very individualistic in the Western world. Um, the, the Protestant Reformation was a very individualistic movement. You know, you can interpret the Bible yourself, uh, except when you disagree with me, apparently, um, in some cases. But uh, there, the, the, the world at the time of the New Testament was still very much a collectivist world, a group, a group culture. Um, I think there's some fundamental aspects to the New Testament that pushed in a more individualistic direction. You know, the idea of justification by faith. Um, faith is an individual matter. I mean, so I think there were some aspects of the New Testament that pushed uh, 
uh, Western culture into a more individualistic direction. But I think we overread that sometimes because of our hyper individualism in the modern world. And so I think it's it's note that if Lydia had any young children, they would have been baptized too, uh, apparently. Her slaves would have been baptized. Well, did they get a choice? I'm not sure they did. I mean, it it totally fits with the culture of that time that Lydia's whole household would be baptized. Um, I'm sure if there was somebody, I'm not doing it, I'm not, you know, no, 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 you know, that, that probably they would have, I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't say that. I mean, maybe Lydia would say, look, if you're going to live in my house, you're going to be a Christian. Um, anyway, her whole household is baptized. And we're going to see uh, with the Philippian jailer in a second um, that he's his whole household is baptized as well. So um, one of the arguments for infant baptism uh, comes from this chapter. The fact that when Lydia and the, and the Philippian jailer become a Christian, their whole bapt household is baptized. This slave girl uh, follows uh, Paul around. And by the way, uh, he liberates a slave here. When he casts the, the spirit out of the girl, the spirit of divination, the spirit that enables her to see future things, uh, which is interesting. Do, do demons know the future? I'm sure they can make good guesses. Um, sometimes uh, telling the future is not just a matter of uh, some crystal ball. Sometimes people can s see what's happening and kind of intuit what's about about to happen. So I won't I won't uh, speculate on the forth telling powers of demons and Satan. Uh, but uh, we do know that Paul liberates a slave here. Um, and I, I, I don't, uh, if I dug into the sermons of abolitionists, uh, founders of the Wesleyan Church were abolitionists, Wesley Methodist Church, you know, I wonder if they used this example. I bet they did. I bet there were some sermons uh, among the Wesleyan Methodists about how Paul, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, liberates a slave girl here. You might say, well, that's, this, this woman is their property. They can't, they can't. And this is what, uh, you know, the Princeton Calvinist probably would have said in response in, in the lead up to the Civil War. They would say, well, she, you can't liberate that slave girl. She's, she's their slave. Um, but God is for liberation. The book of Exodus is for the liberation of those who are under the thumb and oppressed by, by others. God liberates a slave here. She translates who Yahweh is into her categories. These are these men are servants of the Most High God. Um, uh, and we find that in the Old Testament too. Long before there was a crisp understanding of monotheism, uh, there was a sense that Yahweh was El Elyon, the Most High God. God. Melchizedek, long before Moses, long before Scripture, long before the law, Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God, El Elyon. And so this was a way of, of, uh, of bringing the gospel, I'm sure. Uh, Paul does it in Acts 17, as we'll see next week, Lord willing. You know, these are servants of the Most High God. How do, how do you describe Yahweh to a culture that doesn't know the Jewish God? Well, he is the highest God. The Most High God, of course, in Greek culture was Zeus, uh, or in Roman culture, it was Jupiter. Um, we know that there aren't many gods. There's just one God. Uh, but perhaps this was a missionary tool that God used. Of course, Paul's not using it. God's using it. God is translating himself into the understanding uh, of this girl. And so these are servants of the Most High God. That'll, that'll, that'll translate. Oh, you're talking about Zeus. Well, okay, he's a little like Zeus, but let me tell you some more. Um, Paul gets beaten with rods because the the owners of the slave girl are not happy with him at all. Uh, you remember, he and Silas get beaten. They get thrown into jail. Um, there's an earthquake. Um, uh, Paul, up, I think up to this point, Paul has hesitated uh, to highlight the fact that he's a Roman citizen. I think he's a little embarrassed about the fact that he's a Roman citizen. He, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. We speak Hebrew. We speak Aramaic in my household. We read the Bible in Hebrew, you know. Um, and so Paul's a little embarrassed that he can also speak Greek pretty well, that he's had a little bit of a Greek education, maybe even. Um, and, oh, he's a Roman citizen. But he realizes that God can use this here. Uh, and so he turns it around. And from this point on, before he gets beaten, he says, ah, by the way, before you beat me, you should know I'm a Roman citizen. That seems smart to me, <laughs> that he doesn't wait until after the beating to tell them he's a Roman citizen. And so now Paul and Silas, apparently too, uh, highlight the fact that they are Roman citizens. I wonder if there's a little humor in this story. I could be wrong. The, 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 the jailer knows his life is on the line. I mean, remember the, the, the soldiers who uh, are guarding Peter when he escapes, they all get put to death by Herod. Um, and so this jailer knows my life is on the line. Uh, there's an earthquake. The jail, this cha my chains fell off. You know, that's not the tune. Um, but, you know, they could have they 
uh, might, uh, they could have escaped from the, the prison. And the jailer comes in, he says, what must I do to be saved? You know, and Paul says, well, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, um, which is not exactly probably what the jailer uh, was saying. The jailer was saying, what can I do to keep you guys from running out of here? And Paul's like, well, I'll, let me tell you about a different kind of salvation. I don't know if Acts meant to be funny, but there are a couple places where I just kind of smile. And I wonder if, if Luke is having a little bit of, uh, of fun. Well, that concludes our, uh, our run through uh, Acts 16. Took a little longer today, I'm sorry, but it's such fun stuff, such a wonderful, fun, important stuff about the early church here. Um, uh, in the morning after the earthquake, uh, the jailer says, they said you could go. Uh, and Paul says, we're Roman citizens. You might ask them to come down and escort us out. <laughs> but they, they do escort him out and they implore him to leave the city. And apparently he and Silas do. Well, this has been stuff you may not have known or thought about in Acts chapter 16.